What's up, everybody? Today on the Yours Truly podcast, I have my first repeat guest, Jordan Hall. YouTube's a strange place, smaller than I thought it was. Jordan Hall's public conversation about his conversion to Christianity started around the same time I started making videos. What most struck me about his conversion was the geographical context in which it took place. In rural town America, in part of the heartland of evangelicalism, Billy Graham country. I've been to Black Mountain before, in the context of training for a Baptist camp. And that is where Jordan Hall, tech entrepreneur and former CEO, futurist, complex thinker, civium conceptualizer, was captured by the simple yet infinitely complex love of God through Jesus. I posted a video about this fascinating event, like it was a Facebook post that only my family might graciously hit the like button, being the only people paying attention. However, the next day, I woke up to find Jordan himself was one of the three comments on the video. We started up a conversation, and he was my third guest on this podcast. We ended up meeting at the Symbolic World Summit and shared a meal. We embodied the conversation around God's grace in our lives. One of the many conversations I hope to have in this space, one I had not yet landed on, was a conversation about truth and trust related to the proof-of-work conception around money and encryption found in Bitcoin. Since our world seems to be in an all-time low state of trust, could this technology help us rebuild trust as we slowly begin to look at what it means to rebuild the seemingly crumbling and changing world around us? Jordan agreed to have this second conversation with me. We also hit on the future and current realities of artificial intelligence, as well as transhumanism and how it seems that humanity's narrow path forward is through spiritual intelligence and the language of relational love we can discover in that pursuit. So, without further delay, I give you Jordan Hall, Part 2. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. All right, man, we're recording, Jordan. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, man, thanks for coming back on, having another conversation. Um, so one of the conversations here that I've been trying to parse out, this podcast is called Yours Truly. And it's, um, you know, I don't, last time we talked, I shared you shared with you about how um, f- finding out how to become like, a truth, a full person, a pulse, a person full of truth was, um, instead of just like trying to discover what is true. Um, uh-huh. and that, and that, that became something that I experienced and something that I could, like I could feel related to something like conscious, my conscience. And so in that journey, something that has really uh, stood out to me as I started learning more about finance was, um, you know, uh, crypto technology and specifically Bitcoin and how I, I, I began to understand how um, financial relationships were, are supposed to be built on trust and that that's actually been a problem in society uh, over time. And then um, if we're trying to build things based off of things that are true, based off things that we can trust. Um, And with the future of artificial intelligence and, and societal trust, probably at in some ways at an all time low, do you see uh, the, the, the crypto technology, the, um, this idea that Bitcoin can, can have like a deep level like an automatic trust built in as a really solid foundation for, for building something maybe related to, uh, you know, a game B type world with. So let's just walk down the history of money or the way that, um, what was his name? Graber articulated it, um, which I, I think is as close to correct as we're going to get in this generation. And remember that money starts with real 
a high bandwidth relationship of debt. And so it's people who know each other well and have a sense of debt between them. So, so literally like my neighbor and there's the classic, like my, my, uh, my neighbor comes over and borrows a cup of sugar from our house. So now she's indebted to us by a cup of sugar. She remembers it. I remember it. And frankly, a, a number of the other members of the neighborhood might remember it too. So it's embodied in a context of shared relationship um, and just relationships of debt in that larger milieu. And then what happens is, and by the way, I, I've articulated a thought about this notion of the, of the egregore or way of thinking about this category of the demon mammon. There's a, there's, there's a, co-causal relationship that begins to emerge where on the one hand we discover that there's a usefulness of extending the networks of debt relationships outside of the existing context of people who we know well it makes sense right if, if i can find somebody who i don't know well and create a relationship with them where they owe me something or i owe them something then I get the advantage of whatever their skill set or resources or capacity are, <clears throat> which is currently not available inside my community. Uh, but has the, has the disadvantage that that relationship by its very nature is a much lower and with much lower fidelity relationship because I don't know them that well, like, again, by definition. So you have these two things going on. And what happens is, is that we we develop techniques to try to enable that particular piece of the relationship that we care about, which in this case is the ability to have the, uh, the transactional element stay valid. I, we can trust that the debt will be repaid um, without having to necessarily expand our real communal relationship out to include it. This is, sort of, this is, the, this is the technological edge of money. So, for example, one of, one of the earlier versions you would have is um, as the number of debt relationships you're beginning to develop are, are larger than your ability to just remember them easily in your head, you might put them on a stick and you break the stick in half. Right? It's the tally stick. And then what happens is, is that when, when you s resolve the debt, we, we match the two pieces together, verify that, yep, yeah, this is it. And then you're done. You throw it away. You, you break it up so it's gone. Like it's been resolved. And then, of course, it's discovered that if you're holding one side of the tally stick, you could give that to somebody else. That somebody else doesn't know me at all. But now that that debt is now due to them, not to you. And that becomes a, a, a power. There's a, a power of extending a certain quality of relationship, in this case, debt or economic transaction relationships beyond the human environment. And that's a, a huge piece of the human story is actually finding ways of extending the range of our relationships by narrowing them to a purposeful dimension away from the larger holistic rich context of being in uh, communal relationships and so and money is a one of the primary if not the central elements of that a language like written language does that too right? i can read a book mm -hmm. that i've never met so so then it goes down and, and there's a, almost a cascade built in because as you as you think about the those is basically the gradients um and the problem is the one that you mentioned which is okay well how do i how do i trust that the debt will be repaid like why why is it that you you know you've given that tally stick to somebody else like why would they accept that they don't know me and so there's a process of okay well now we're going to move it to a different di dimension into a different dimension now it's going to be in gold as opposed to a tally stick which is just bound to a single person the gold is now bound to an entire society that takes this coin as currency. And that, of course, increases the value dramatically because the likelihood, you know, let's say I won't take the gold in exchange for eggs, but there's 50 other people who will take the gold and trade it for eggs. And so now you don't necessarily care who's giving you the eggs. As long as you know you can get eggs for gold, you're good. And so that, that abstraction layer pops it up as we have this trajectory. But... Um, as we move into a more and more abstract kind of money, we, we begin to remove elements of, or we begin to play with a niche. You get, you get the idea of niche, like a, yeah. an opportunity for, for exploration and, and uh, exploitation. Like a, like in a subcategory of something. Yeah, yeah. And, and in particular, the, the, the notion of, uh, in this case, I'm using it in the sense of uh, evolutionary theory. So, uh, 
a particular territory that can be exploited for resources. And the niche here, in fact, is the niche of, of, of the gaps in the trust. Uh, so either I can uh, clip the edges off the coins, or mm -hmm. I can, can try to create, uh, obviously, counterfeit coins. Um, and eventually what ends up happening is the king realizes that if the king puts his stamp on the coin, it says only the king's stamp, now the king gets the advantage of being able to do, uh, what's that called? It's not demurrage, it's the opposite. I can't remember anymore. Um, but the advantage being now my I, I'm the producer of money. It's not just gold, it's the king's gold that is money. So that's another niche in the exploitation of the field around money. But of course, then the king realizes, well, I, since the king's face is what matters, not the gold, now I'm going to start issuing coins that have less and less gold in them. We go in this right. kind of cascade of debasement of the currency until eventually the currency collapses because the trust has been mined out of it. And this is an arc that seems to happen over and over again. It seems to be built yes. into the technology of money that um, the niche of exploiting the edges around the amount of trust that is invested in the money and the various techniques um, ultimately ends up eroding and, and, and hollowing out it out from the inside until there's a point where the trust starts having catastrophic breaks and then you get some kind of collapse. Now, um, gold bugs, people who are very deeply said, no, no, gold is the answer, s want to believe that they can simply put trust in gold and that would be solid forever. Land bugs, there's not as many of them, but they have the same idea around land. And the notion is, well, land is, is so fundamentally anchored in generativity that that's a, a core resource. And there's other folks like energy. Energy is fundamental in the stack. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that history has shown that no matter where, every time we reset and ground it on something, it keeps going down that slide. There's something about that slide that just seems to be baked in. So we come across finally to this thing, um, crypto or blockchain or Bitcoin, depending on your preference. And when I say Bitcoin, what I'll be referring to is a proof of work based blockchain. So I don't necessarily mean BTC. Uh, I mean, proof of work based blockchain, of which BTC currently has the largest difficulty in proof of work and therefore is the most secure at that level. Um, different variations on the theme are out there. So the, the notion, as you mentioned, is that in principle, it's trustless, meaning you don't have to have, it's by definition designed to solve the problem that you couldn't, you might not be able to trust your counterparty and you don't need to. And in this case, the network is, is designed in such a way that all you have to be able to do is trust something which you can in fact prove. And it's mathematically provable. It's transparent in terms of how it operates. It's very easy to, well, it's relatively easy to check what's happening inside and in what it is and how it works and its design and its current state. And therefore, you independently on the basis of just of reason and, and analysis can, yep, this is this will do what it says it does. And it is what it presents itself as being, which is to say there's no niche for mm -hmm. exploitation in its interior. There's a lot, lot of niche for exploitation in the exterior. Right. There's all kind of rug pull scam universe. Yeah, sh shitcoin. Shitcoin. Shit coins, and, and, and you can think like a sh the shit coin is what happens when you say, Well, we're going to create something which is, in fact, not Bitcoin, mm -hmm. pretend like it's better because we can we can do other things with it that make it a little bit shinier, along particularly the vector of speculating. <clears throat> Speculation, if this is the a shit coin, is the equivalent of clipping the edges of the gold coin, right? Or debasing the currency. Um, but that's the idea. Right. So now what I want to do is I want to frame that maybe a little bit in the model that I've been putting forth in the context of Civium. Yep. Right. So the, the notion here is to say that for, let's just call it 10,000 years, it may have been 50,000 years, depending on your archaeology, um, or 5,000 years in the context of money. But we've been on a, on a, on a, a, in a bridge crossing from one space to another space. Right? But we've been moving from the anthropological in indigenous human mode, which is that earlier fray, a moment where money or debt was entirely bound by real, rich, highly complex Dunbar scale human relationships. Then as we exited that, we've been exiting on this journey. Now we're slightly Old Testament here. We've been, we've been on a, a long journey through the wilderness. Well, I guess in the scope of the, even just our species, it's not that long. 10,000 years is a blink of the eye. Um, exploring this new possibility of these 
abstractions, these languages, these things that enable us to do new capabilities, but seem to have broken uh, failure events tied into them, right? the, the various elements of civilization, uh, which money is powerful, but it's by no means the only one. And the hypothesis is that we're, we're now reaching the end of that journey, yeah. we're reaching a point where um, media or virtualization or um, the ability to separate the medium and the message is reaching its fulfillment in the digital, which represents all possible media, and the computational, which represents the, 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 the maximization of the algorithmic version of intelligence. And, and on the other side of that bridge, maybe another stable state. So the idea is, hey, you're moving from the purely human to this new thing over here, where we're actually having both the human and the virtual, but now they're both in a stable location and can, can be in, in some kind of, of uh, stable relationship. And so in that case, for example, something like proof of work, energetic proof of work, and I think that's the only real kind of talking about it, but just to be clear, a proof of work that is based upon the use of energy and the relationship between information and energy um, might in fact be, I can't quite prove it. I can't like make the, the argument at, the, at a mathematically strong level, but Perkowski and I have done a lot of conversations about this using analogies to deeper substrates like mitochondria. Right. Uh, I've heard, I heard you uh, talk about the electron transport chain. Yep. Like in yeah. the, in, in the ATPAs. Um, Dan. The idea is that the idea is that we could take a look at two or three examples of the same kind of thing with mitochondrion being one example and a water wheel, a mill being another example. And then mm -hmm. finally Bitcoin being a third example and say, Hey, these are all actually participating in a more fundamental abstraction. Yes. They're all examples of a more fundamental abstraction. Therefore, we can use that to predict what it looks like. And okay, if that model is correct, then that would say that Bitcoin is effectively the mitochondrion of this new, um, I guess it'd be a portal pathway, a new way, a new, a new stable state post you know, the end of digital, as it were. Um, do you want me to go into that a little bit? That's yeah. I mean, that, that's cracking open a lot, but I want to make sure I'm not. Uh, no, I mean, that's, so I, to let you know a little bit of my background, I, I have some basic understanding of anatomy and physiology and microbiology. I'm a registered nurse and I used to tutor that. My father-in-law is a general surgeon and he was the one that tutored me going through like that. So th those, those aren't super abstract ideas for me. Like, so yeah, we can kind of go into how those relate. Well, to, to, to dig into this, it's going to get real abstract real quick. Uh, okay, so I'll let do. Me know, let me know <laughs> if, it starts, if, if, if the wheels start coming off the bus. Okay. Um, but the the notion is that let me see if I can go back and get the whole thing so I can say it properly. Well, let's just let's just use mitochondria to begin with. At a very very basic level, we have something like pattern, energy, mm -hmm. and the relationship between them maybe like a, an ontological substrate that's fundamental. And the embodiment of pattern requires some movement of energy. Uh, oftentimes, an existing pattern that has had a movement of energy would be called matter, for example. And so a, a molecule of water is a pattern that has been embodied by means of certain kinds of energy, which is an assemblage of previous patterns that have embodied until we go all the way back to quantum foam. I'm invoking entirely the standard model of physics and most quantum the, foam that might be beyond, did you say quantum foam quantum foam yeah yeah that's <laughs> that's beyond me so. that's the that's the that's the that's the moment where we move from a, a non-collapsed quantum the, the sort of the quantum field as a pure uh, integration of all quantum potentials into into the collapsing events that occur on a continuing basis we don't quite have any clue exactly what's happening there um, but that when we describe quantum mechanics at its basic level, we say, okay, a particular quantum uh, possibility collapses under observation, by the way, and this is the where the hands start to wave vigorously in terms of the metaphysics of what's going on. But at, a, at an experimental level, this is what it looks like. And so quantum foam at the, at the level right between um, something that exists entirely in, ma in math, we can't describe it as, a, as an ontological event, Two things that begin to have an ontological characteristic, and we start describing them 
um, as having like mass and location and velocity and characteristics that we think of as having and sort of matter particle characteristics. A reality of being, and then there's something that we don't know. And something that's in, in the transition period. And mm -hmm. so um, there's a buildup, right? So we, we go from subatomic particles, right? The word particles may be an easy way of saying a particle, subatomic particles. And then they bind into atomic particles and they bind into molecules and they bind into more and more complicated molecules, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up. And so at each stage, there's, there's a bridge that, that connects one stage to another stage. So we're, we're, in, we're in the entirely chemical stage um, and we're dealing with the, the logic and the physics of molecules and stochastic chemical processes and catalysts and things like that. Um, as it's bridging across into the organic stage, which has much more complex structures that change the fields of possibility and the fields of, of uh, potential in chemistry. And so example, for example, a cell wall creates an interior and an exterior milieu. And that difference between the two enables possibilities in the interior that couldn't have happened if it was simply happening broadly. And you can create new concentration gradients because the concentration gradient can happen on the inside and the wall holds it so it doesn't just osmotically differentiate back out into the into the ocean in this case. And that's what's interesting about the mitochondria is it's like a cell within a cell in a way. Well, exactly. It, so what, we're, what we see with the mitochondria is that you've got a, the primary problem of moving from the inorganic to the organic is regular energy gradient. And so under certain energy gradients, um, and by, we think this is the case that things like um, just like thin, uh, shallow water where the energy of the sun against a black rock, for example, creates a thermal gradient that moves from the rock up through the water. So that creates an energy gradient and that produces uh, just enough uh, stable energy to start forming cell walls, for example, or creating molecular chains that couldn't happen in a place that didn't have that kind of an energy gradient. But that's a really rare location and just flows of cool water can disrupt it. Like it's not stable enough to build anything really complex. But what it does is it it, it um, begins a path. And I'll, I'll say the word search. And I don't necessarily mean like, well, now it gets, I'm, I'm noticing uh, Michael Levin's work on intelligence in there. It's not intelligence the way that we would naively understand it. But we, what we might in fact be describing what intelligence is at its most fundamental sense which is the search of a landscape of possibility until a particular um, stable path is found. And in this case, the mitochondrion is a, is a very particular kind of solution because it um, takes what is a relatively, how do I say, uh, stochastic ambient source of potential energy out in the, in the external environment, puts it through a series of transformations that ultimately output ATP. And ATP is the magic, the magic of the of the thing. Because once ATP is there, ATP is a sort of a generic universal source of simple energy that can plug into a very large number of chemical processes and becomes the engine of organic uh, process. You've got this long period of time playing with, let's say, um, low quality. Think about the, notice the mapping back to money. Uh, low quality forms of stable energy that give rise to different cellular style structures, not the least of which is the mitochondrion. Um, until you hit the sweet spot and then can begin producing ATP. And once you hit ATP, you're off to the races. Organic processes can now begin to run and you start getting more and more complex uh, organic uh, environments. So that's the example back then. I raced through it and I apologize for those who are experts in that domain, how rough that was, but you get the gist of it, I suppose. Yeah, that the... The co I mean, I think part of the theory was that it was actually maybe E. coli that was co-opted into the cell, possibly that, or some kind of ancestor of that, that created um, the mitochondrion as, um, as an energy creating uh, source. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, the, um, that there was a, uh, yeah, please, please keep going. Yeah, but the thing that I, the thing that it, when I was studying all that, I began, I did notice that these patterns like, oh, this is like, this is, and you already mentioned it, it's like a water dam, like mm -hmm. inside, inside each cell happening constantly over and over again, the adenosine triphosphates being created, uh, because the, you know, you say energy is like the protons are literally like behind a dam, they flow through a power generator and they flow down. 
And I guess maybe where we're like aiming at right now in the conversation is, can we do something like that with energy, uh, like a, a economic or monetary energy in a way that just self goes, um, self produces? So we have these, our, our social environment, and we were talking about this arc of money, what, we, we, what we've discovered over the last, so in, in this, a similar fashion to the pre mitochondria cellular time, what we have discovered over the past 10,000 years is there's this very powerful coordination capacity that scales, meaning we can get effectively everybody in the planet um, involved in some kind of coordination structure that, that radically increases our uh, wealth generation capacity, right? our, our economic collaboration of, which is effectively Metcalf's law driven, is very, very large when everybody's involved. Um, and that's what money can do, right? It can enable that kind of broad scale coordination. But it has these failure conditions like, oh, we're all just basically tapping into an energy gradient of the sun on, on, on a volcanic rock. That's not very stable. It keeps collapsing on us. What are we going to do? So we're looking for a pattern that can convert energy into a stable pattern. Right? So there's two kinds of patterns here. One is the pattern, in this case, mitochondria, stable pattern, ATP, that then can become something upon which we can build an entirely new strata. So we're looking for a version of money that is a, a pattern that is a kind of money that is able to produce a stable pattern of converting energy into that itself, so as to become a foundation upon which this new strata can be built. You know? And so if that's the analogy, the analogy is that the whole of civilization has been like the, the bridge between the, pre, the inorganic to the organic. And this thing, Bitcoin, proof of work, um, is exactly the mitochondria, meaning it is a kind of money which enables a, uh, well, actually enables a number of things, which I'll describe in a moment, but it enables the scalable coordination between all agents that can perceive it as a, as a, as a valuable thing, which can include, by the way, various forms of AI, yeah. uh, even very stupid ones, just what's that called internet of things can can use this to coordinate um and has a stability to it that is vastly vastly like orders and orders of magnitude more than previous monetary systems so that's the that's the proposition um an additional use case and i can't tell right now whether this is actually more fundamental i mean it may be more fundamental than, than the coordination structure um, or maybe I'm saying it wrong. Maybe what I mean is to say that it's because digital represents all kinds of media, um, because Bitcoin is digital, it includes all the different variations on media that enable coordination. So for example, um, the ability to establish provenance in some form of media expression, Prov provenance meaning uh, vi this video, for example, uh, if we were to take this video and upload it to the Bitcoin blockchain, um, anybody who watches it in the future can be 100% certain that it, it has not been tampered with. It is exactly what it was at the moment of its uploading. Uh, and can and any additional metadata that are associated with it, my name, your name, you know, the date of, they can get absolute certainty on that particular information. So in a world, for example, of deep fakes, where the ability to exploit the niche of the of our ability to trust media um, is accelerating and, and it is accelerating towards terminus. There's, there's no, it would be trivial in weeks, really, for somebody to take this video, run AI against it, and have me saying all kinds of things that I'm not actually saying. That would be a triviality. So that creates a fork, um, either our ability to coordinate by means of digital communication collapses and think about that in terms of a monetary collapse or we bind digital communication to this substrate that has provenance built in that's and so this is where the game b or the uh, sorry the civium idea is is come together because that's that's the other part of this that i was i heard a snippet of you mention this in a conversation but that and again, I mean, we're talking about trust. So, you know, you and I, 
uh, started a conversation a few months ago. Then we met in real life uh, at Symbolic World, and and so okay, well I know that I, this person's real, <laughs> but you were just saying that th at some point th um, the trust in in what we're doing right now is is going to break down. Yeah, and so is the blockchain and something like non fungible tokens or non, you know, what these, um, taking, like you said, this conversation and, and putting it onto those rails and it has a way of identify, identifying that this really happened to a certain degree. And, um, yeah, how do we get there? Or, you know, I guess it's kind of what, or you, you said, it sounded like you said that there are people trying to, uh, work on that problem. Um, but that does, that does seem like an answer. And that is something that I'm worried about that even as like, I've watched other people having conversations, I think we are, we are actually very close to reaching a tipping point where it's like, I don't know if I can at some point, am I going to be able to trust these at all? Right. Well, it, I'm not at all worried, although that's maybe because I live kind of high on the abstraction stack, because what we can say is with, with very high confidence, there's a, uh, a selection event occurring. I mean this again in kind of the evolutionary sense. Um, all those coordination structures or groups of people that are not either entirely organic, in other words, not mediated by the digital. So they're either local communities of people who just know each other or all the way over here, you know, utilizing um, trust, blockchain style, proof of work style, provenance to have absolute certainty of provenance, right? Everything in the middle between those two, all those groups that are using this, which is almost everything, right? In the middle, those will event, those will evaporate into nothingness in a finite time. And that finite time might be in the order of decades. Um, because as you say, the ability to inject falsehood into those spaces is going, is, is going exponential. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, those falsehoods can be increasingly sophisticated they can be very very tiny like 99 percent true with just like one word off uh, and, and by the way you could have ai bots like there could be an ai bot that does nothing but watch me and does nothing but inject that one word into everything i say right it doesn't have to be you know, the sophistication of the ability to false create a, a simulation um is going exponential and so the space in the middle becomes a non-existing niche it doesn't it collapses on itself um, and so as a result, uh, even though it may only be a small number of coordination structures that are sitting on this side of the equation right now, those are the only ones that are going to survive. And so people will begin to migrate over there um, and these, and, and then they'll begin to grow. Right? So it's. Uh, so it has to happen. It has to happen. It has to happen. Yeah. If it ha the, 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 the real risk is. The, the real risk is actually if our exi the existing coordination structures that live in here, nation states, simultaneously prevent this from being able to be established in any stable way, but don't actually do this themselves. And so there's a handful. China's already doing this. So that's whatever. They're, they're, so they'll be around. So that's already they're already done. But in the West, we might we might sort of have this weird thing with the existing coordination structures are doing everything in their power to simultaneously prevent the new coordination structures from emerging without actually becoming new coordination structures themselves until we're so far down the road that the collapse actually happens faster than a migration can occur. And that'd be a, that would be a dark age. And the, and the reason why it would be a dark age is less informational than that also is an economic collapse because economic structure, uh, coordination structures include how we communicate but how we coordinate in all the ways. And so economic collapse would be, um, has deeper stack implications. You would stop being able to do things like produce food and energy and distribute it. Um, you can imagine like a simple example would be something like, um, well, I mean, maybe the, the easy example would be, would be if we actually had a, something that's falsified economic transactions. And so you couldn't trust money anymore. Um, or, or even just falsified orders like invoice orders. And so people yeah. getting invoice orders in, in their business systems that were false. And then that was jamming their ability to settle and settlement began to break down. Like you had AIs that were 
creating false communications. You're calling customer support. It's telling you that everything's okay. It's issuing you a new reclamation, like that kind of a jamming system, which, you know, it would require intelligence to develop that, but plenty of malevolent actors might choose to do it for lots of different reasons. And the, because intelligence is becoming cheaper and cheaper, um, it's easier and easier to produce that level of intelligence. I don't want to, that, that painting that story is just as illustrative of the point at the abstraction level. That if we don't, the only real risk, I'm, I'm, it's weird, as I'm saying it, it sounds like it's, it's scary, but the point is, it's actually a relatively narrow path. In most scenarios, almost all of them, enough migrate over to this more stable location that even if the existing coordination structures do collapse, it doesn't matter for, you know, like, oh, okay, I'm switching over to this one, that's fine. I'll be using, I'll use signal instead of, uh, you know, CNN or whatever it happens to be. What is signal? Oh, signal is a, an open source app that has strong encryption built in. It doesn't have strong identity provenance built in. Uh, it's, it's okay. And so if I send you a, uh, a message over signal, what you can be confident is that nobody else is reading that message unless they've hacked your phone, by the way, but that's, if they're actually sitting on your phone, of course, they'll see it, but nothing in between. Um, and it would be relatively trivial to upgrade signal to have strong identity provenance, meaning that you could be confident that it is actually me who sent it. So kind of pointing on these like uh, points of anxiety, uh, you know, about the future, which sent you on a certain quest, I think, um, to, you know, and uh, came to a certain point within the last year or so where your your life changed with uh putting faith in in christ becoming a christian and um what i yesterday i kind of did my own little version of some uh open source i said hey, i am going to be talking to jordan again what are some things uh, people might have like uh, uh questions and there was kind of a tone of, of anxiety about the future of AI was kind of a general, um, and you know, we've already kind of, <laughs> you've already kind of like unpacked that a lot, but another question was about kind of how that fits to transhumanism whenever, you know, like this gets up here or in a contact lens or whatever, you know, sci-fi we can imagine, but that, that those things. I began to notice several years ago, it's like sci-fi is not that interesting in, in certain aspects of it, like the just because so much of it's real now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that makes me think, well, yeah, then that's, this could, you know, like the Black Mirror show that came out. Of, um, are you still with me? Yep. I, if my, my, I yeah, my, my, I think last time we talked, you said your screen like went blank or something like, and the, mine's been, mine's done that twice now. Mm. Um, but yeah, so um, I guess seeing the, you know, looking to the future and is that the, uh, is, is, is it the same, do you see it as the same where there's this uh, narrow path where so this certain people want to do this kind of transhuman thing and really there's only, yeah, so if you're not going to do that, it's the, the path is pretty narrow. We're just going to go to Black Mountain or something. <laughs> well, not everybody can come here. It's not that big. Um, <laughs> let's see. I Just FYI, from an aesthetics perspective, I did want to point out that it feels really fun and appropriate in the terms of my journey to, to juxtapose a very esoteric mitochondria, blockchain, Bitcoin conversation now with the conversation about Christ. Like, And the fact that, for, as far as I'm concerned, those all make perfect sense together um they do because they have to deal with yeah. truth they they hmm. deal with truth to me that's what makes sense to me and, and in this case uh, well in some cases in the context of christ a recovery like a, a truth of reconnecting and in the context of the other ones a discovery or a um, reaching towards and grabbing something that is not yet clear or obvious and bring it in but in, in both cases it's a reaching out of the existing modern paradigmatic system and trying to grab a truth that lives outside of that sphere. Um, let's see. So the one way of thinking about the AI. Okay. Okay. Here's a way of doing it. 
one way of thinking about the AI problem is kinds of intelligence. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Kinds of intelligence. So the first kind of intelligence, I'm a little bit invoking uh, Ian McGilchrist here, is the, the kind of intelligence that we're very familiar with in the context of the left brain intelligence, analytic intelligence, algorithmic intelligence, um, which through the arc of the Enlightenment and the arc of modernity has become the dominant form of intelligence that is the both the, the grease and the fuel of our social system. And we use that kind of intelligence to run society and, and therefore has become increasingly identified as intelligence itself. Okay. And the problem of AI is that the AI is better at that kind of intelligence than we are. It's kind of the simplest way of putting it. And, and we can we can run that across any particular domain. And so as a kid, I remember when I got my first calculator, it's probably about first grade. And I noticed that the calculator was a lot better at multiplying numbers together than I was in my head. And that's as simple as that. Right? just multiply that across all domains um and of course the point is that more and more domains have become captured in that in that black hole in the center as time has gone on of course the the big chat gpt 3.5 or the gpt 3.5 and the chat gpt version of that was this big oh, whoa it just crossed another threshold or right? it's better at a bunch of stuff than many many humans and it's better at certain kinds of things than every human oh wow and is there any limit to what this thing can do and the shorter answer is in that category of intelligence no there is no limit right so in that category of intelligence we will categorically find ourselves subordinate to computational intelligence um, across all possible applications of that kind of intelligence and if you're in that if you don't recognize there's two kinds of intelligence then you're stuck and right? this is kind of the elon musk neural link game right he looks at it and says okay well there's only two variations on the theme only two branches on this on this path one branch is ai just eats our lunch and escapes forever and we're just evaporated from the story the other is we effectively turn our brains into communications nodes that allows us to participate in that velocity of analytical intelligence um and eventually grow into increasingly how would you say esoteric biological appendages to the, the the silicon substrate the borg yeah the borg something like that and become bored and that's like the best hope right from on that arc but the good news <laughs> is that that's only one kind of intelligence and it's the least the lesser and the least important kind of intelligence the other kind of intelligence is over here now McGilchrist talks about that kind of intelligence in the frame of the right brain but the argument that I would make is that the right brain is merely the instrument of facilitation or relationship or, or a part of the significant part of how our bodies relate to that kind of intelligence, because that kind of intelligence is the intelligence, not of the analytic and analytic here means breaking apart. So analytic is you break something into smaller pieces and then you, you know, work with them in that smaller piece. But now we're talking about something which is, synthetic or well integrated or more specific holistic an actual whole so that kind of intelligence operates in a completely different way um, and computational intelligence doesn't participate in that fashion at all like zero percent um okay let's see how do i step there make it a, well, make it a, a path that we can walk well one down. one maybe this will help was that i i heard you say that i think you were talking to brendan graham dempsey that you said at one point during your um, your journey, you were taking the large language models like ChatGPT or something, and you were having theologians talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Could, I wanted to know what that exactly what that. I wanted you to kind of hone in on that. So okay. that was like using that. I guess I don't know if that bridges the gap, but I thought that it was does. So it, but it's a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it does. Who knows? How, how, this is the point. Yeah, hold on to that that little bit. Or get me back when I say this is the point. Just remind me of that. This is right. the point. So uh, the way chat GPT and most of the LLMs work is that prompt engineering is a very important part because they're these gigantic, um, I would say, probabilistic spaces of relationships between words. At the end of the day, that's all they really are. 
Um, but with a prompt, you can collapse that space into a much narrower or smaller space. And we call that like personing them. So they're, they're sort of all this jibber jabber of every piece of text that's been written, more or less. You can say, well, okay, what I want you to do is this. I want you to um, only use the works of St. Thomas Aquinas or over bias towards the works of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I want you to run a double loop that every time that you respond to something in the voice of St. Thomas Aquinas, I want you to then to then check and verify that that's the kind of thing, that the content and the, and the style that the Aquinas would use. Like you, you can create these, these prompts that produce a sort of, of a filter that um, it doesn't do a perfect job, but it can do a much better job than just having it run on its own call it 60 to 80 percent better um, in becoming like a particular persona. Now, with regard to, interestingly enough, theological texts, I found this to be quite curious. Uh, if you try to do this with secular texts, these days in particular, it tends to throw up, um, sorry, that's copyrighted material. I can't do Nietzsche um, or whatever, whoever has. Certainly, the closer you get to the contemporary era, the harder and harder it gets. But the Bible, my friend, is in there entirely. And by the way, many different translations, um, and it can do Hebrew, and it can do Greek, and it can do it all real well. Um, weirdly, it had trouble with Greek philosophy, but I got it. I figured out how to get out of that. Jail broke its Greek philosophy block somehow. I can't remember what it was. Um, so essentially, what I would do is I would say, okay, I'm, I'm right now, I can't remember what, a good example of a topic. Oh, well, William, one that's recent is, okay, I I'd like to explore this question of faith as it shows up in the New Testament. But what I want to do is I want to bring um, Socrates and the the sophist Gorgias, Gorgias into the conversation. And then I want to have um, St. Paul. Actually, let me, let me have St. Paul in there. Uh, and then let me put uh, Augustine and, uh, and Aquinas in this conversation. Right? So I have to create the prompt. I have to create the identities. It's actually a pretty structured process to, to sort of make sure that each identity is tracked properly. And then it's okay. And I want the topic of, of the focus not to be just on what does faith mean, but also an orientation towards the words, the etymology, the language, right? recognizing that some, the, the language, for example, that um, Aquinas wasn't necessarily using the Greek, right? He was using the Latin and that's a, there's a difference. Okay. So teasing out those differences and then allow them to run and say, okay, have the conversation go for X number of, you know, issues. And then, and then I can interact with them. Sometimes I'll be in the, I'll say, I'm also there so I can communicate. Sometimes I'm not there and I'm watching. So that's an example of what it looks like. Um, go ahead. Uh, the reason that was really interesting to me, and I don't want to lose whatever the point was that we were at last year, but I do want to further this, was I've been uh, kind of thinking through this idea that like in the Reformation um, with Martin Luther, and I'm not a scholar on it. I went, I did a, a study on it through like the great courses. I don't know if you know what those are or not, but they're kind of like college lectures you can listen to. And, yeah. and I went through one probably 10 years ago with my father-in-law about, um, it was the you know history of Martin Luther. And he was, Luther, he was Lutheran at the time. But as I look at it now, I think, and I think about even like these conversations, but even now adding this conversation that you were having with the type of AI is... Um, these huge changes that were made in the church by key figures like Luther or Calvin, but even Augustine and, and others, um, they were made in a certain type of isolation. These guys were writing, responding to other texts. It was hard to find a conversation partner to maybe, you know, balance or, or work these things out. Um, and it's so interesting when you said that, I was like, oh man, what would it have been like if they, if, if they had had that kind of ability to communicate their ideas with other people that would maybe help them hone these ideas uh, other than being more isolated in that. And, and here, and we're kind of a result of, of that happening, you know, 500,000 years ago. So and that, that was, that was what was really interesting to me is it made me think that what we're able to do now with the, with these mediums and even that specific example that you gave with what how you're playing with theologians and philosophers talking to each other um 
that that just kind of blew my mind. Uh, and it made me think that they were kind of alone in those ideas, I guess, to a certain degree, in that we have this ability with something along the lines of this cybernetic conversation to make the make the future really interesting in how it's happening. All right, so we're getting close to the to the point. Um, that's nice. Um, all right, so first order in the context of using GPT to simulate these conversations, by definition, I'm only able to enter into the aspect of these particular persons that is a capturable in the form of written words. That they wrote. And, and, and in fact, was. So, you know, for example, I don't have access to any of Paul's personal conversations with the actual Corinthians when he was in Corinth, which was a lot more than his letter. Right. Um, and even in relationship to the letter, all I have access to is that particular aspect of his larger person. Uh, and of course, if I'm using GPT to do it, we're going to be walking carefully here around the theological issue. Um, GPT is in, engaging entirely with the semantic characteristic, which is to say whatever meaning can be conveyed in words, lowercase w alone. And this is, again, to say that we're reaching a point where in, in that way of doing things, there we go, in that way of understanding, um, the analytic, the semantic, the mental, um, AI reaches is better at that than us. And that's literary. Not and literary. Literary and literal, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not demoralizing. Again, because that's actually a narrowing. That's only one kind of intelligence, and it's the less important kind of intelligence. And so what I would say is, is that a big part of the branch of what has happened, and maybe always happens in something like theology, is because if I'm reading Augustine, at the end of the day, I'm only able to read, it is very much like re relating to the chat GPT version of him, because the rest of him is long gone. And all I'm getting is the words and, and the skillfulness of the words he put there. And I'm, and I'm, I'm interacting with them using the aspect of my mind that is taking those words and trying to understand them. Right? So it's a linguistic relationship. And because that's actually ultimately a very narrow and very finite possibility. And here now I'm thinking about, um, who's that poem? Borges. Have you ever, ever read that book, The Library? I think I've heard of it, I think. Well, Borges is a, a poet. I think he's Argentinian. He explored this kind of question a lot in lots of different ways. And one version of it was this notion of a library. And the idea was that it was a library that contained the combinatorial of all possible combinations of letters. So there was one book that was just the letter A. There's another book that was the letter A, A, and then, mm -hmm. then A, 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 and then A, B, right? And just explode. And the point, of course, is that all possible books are contained in that library because all possible combinations of letters are contained in the library and all books ultimately at the end of the day are combinations of letters. That's another way of describing the AI, the analytic. If you look at it entirely through that lens and you say that that's the thing, then you're done. And then that's what you, his poems address that. But if I flip over here and say, well, that's only one kind of intelligence. The other kind of intelligence is the kind of intelligence that is has continuity. It's, it's not analytic. It's connected. It's connected ultimately to everything. It is holistic in nature, and it's a deeper, more fundamental kind of intelligence. And it's the thing that actually is putting the meaning in the words. Right? So when I utter words out, the meaning is not in the words. Right? The meaning comes in a, in a, in a pre-linguistic sense, and then is ultimately uh, form-fitted to the best words that I am capable of at this moment to put them across this channel so that you can communicate them. And at its best, what happens is that that language is not the meaning is not in the words themselves, but rather almost a channel is opened up between us. The words allow us to come into a kind of resonance or a kind of relationship where our more holistic sensibility is beginning to be coordinated to the same location in the transcendent. And we're sort of sharing a larger consciousness of the same kind of thing. And so that's the what art or the artistic sensibility does as opposed to say the literate or the literal sensibility. 
So the literal sensibility, I don't know if you've watched the conversation I did with uh, Greg Enriquez and Vervek here. I was talking about these three different kinds of language. No. That's a pretty good one. Uh, so I'll recapitulate it a little bit. The idea was that by hypothesis, I'm just, you know, I made it out, but it seems in, as I spent time with it, it feels still useful. Um, you have trade language, you have family language, and you have sacred language. And, and family language is entirely about relationship and is as is, is, is conveyed in facial expressions and tone as it is in words. And so you can imagine like a troop of baboons or a troop of gibbons and just hearing the the, the the rise and fall of sounds and then you hear a little change in like what sounds oh those are the young ones okay there's a little bit more agitation or like as a parent like you can you hear your kid playing in the other room you're not really listening to what they're saying you're just listening to the tone and as long as the tone is a certain volume you know they're okay they're taking care of themselves everything's fine if it changes slightly you know and by the way you can tell by the tenor if they if they yell you can tell whether that's a, a yell of frustration a yell of agitation a yell of alarm or a yell of yes. alarm right those qualities, that's family language. Um, trade language is what we're speaking right now. Trade language is what happens when you're actually needing to communicate something which is very purposeful. It's like money, back to the beginning of our conversation. Um, very purposeful, usually about transactions, yes. uh, where we have no family relationship. We have no sensitivity of, of quality. I don't know who you are in any meaningful sense. I don't really necessarily care about you that much, but we got to get shit done. Um, and so... We craft a mechanism that can solve those kinds of problems. Hammer, give me the hammer, right? Or you know, give me the whatever. Uh, go there, do that, right? It's a coordination structure, and so it does that pretty well. Now, what happened, of course, is that in the context of civilization, and in the context of cosmopolitan imperialism, where all of our families began to be decontextualized and absorbed into this new kind of coordination structure, back to money, for example, um, we lost our family languages almost entirely. We endeavor to navigate family by means of a trade language, in this case, English. And we tend to take all language as being trade language. So mm -hmm. back then, finally, the sacred language. <clears throat> and sacred language is what is, connects us with this larger whole. So I have this triangle, but if I take the triangle and I notice this right point, sacred language, that actually is the entire the entirety of reality. <laughs> so it's a really big thing over there. It's not like it's not a symmetric triangle. I've got these humans doing human things over here, and I've got literally everything else in the entire uh, world connected to sacred language and the right brain right, is pulling in all these signals these subtle signals by the way not just the right brain but spirit so now we'll shift into a formerly christian language right? spirit the, the the instrumentality of faith is receiving these qualities of of sensitivity these feelings <clears throat> that are subtle in nature um not necessarily local, spatially, not necessarily obvious where they're coming from or what they are, but is integrating them into something that eventually can be perceived and ultimately can be uh, expressed. Right? So that's. I, so that's. That kind of leads me into this idea that these kind of conversations. Um, intellectual abstract there and, and even in the propositional and maybe the perspectival i'm not, not sure if i'm using that one right but they and even existing and uh, thinking about technology thinking about the future uh, we have so outpaced our procedural knowing our procedural spiritual language mm -hmm. um and as somebody that was a practitioner of this spiritual thing for like 15 years, hey, let's do the spiritual thing this Sunday. I'm planning the spiritual thing this Sunday. Um, except it was very, uh, I'm going to say it was stripped down of a lot of possible meaning um, oh, yeah. with just like rock and roll. Not that there wasn't meaning there, but there was stripped down of a lot of possible meaning. And as I'm leaning into trying to find more um, procedural ways of knowing and, and meaning in the spiritual space. It seems like, like say, I step out of this conversation and I'm going to go live my life today. Actually, the eclipse is today, and it's passing right over us. We're having this big family get together. It's going to be mm -hmm. fun. But I, I, I'm not sure if exactly what you're saying about the whole spirit, like the spiritual language being like the, a huge part of reality is that we have been operating in a very small part of reality. 
mm-hmm. as a culture and as a civilization, or at least in the modern context. And, um, and we've like outpaced a type of knowing. And I think it, when I look at like a worship service or a church service or a gathering, it seems very simple in a certain way compared to these grand and fast uh, and large technological, futuristic, theological ideas that when, when we step out of this digital world and we land into the real world and we're... And then we have these opportunities to do that in our families, opportunities maybe to do that in our jobs, opportunities to do that then in this kind of stacked meaning, this hierarchy to that weak point where we meet at, in worship. Um, we are, I just feel like we are so outpaced or we're obviously disconnected, but outpaced from a type of, of uh, language and knowledge of... Um, of religious doing, religious practice, spiritual doing, spiritual practice. Spirit, it, it seems it seems simple in comparison to this giant world of technology and AI and fast and, and global and all this stuff. It seems so, and that we have to be experts on everything, almost. Mm-hmm. That we're that this part of our life that I think in some ways you just said is 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 even bigger in all of reality. We're way we way outpaced that, and it's hard to it's almost like we have to learn how to crawl again or something. I don't know. Well, the finite, <clears throat> I'm familiar with Leibniz's notion of the, the limit. No. So he has this construct, which is useful, right? but the point is it's also a little bit distracting or disorienting. The limit as X approaches infinity. And so we can, we can say, hey, we can, we're not going to get to infinity. But let's imagine what happens as X gets closer and closer to infinity. And at a certain point, we're going to kind of wave our hands and throw away the infinity part and just take X <clears throat> or take the limit as X approaches infinity. And this is very useful for doing certain kinds of uh, mathematics and in particular engineering. Well, that notion of pace, um, the outpacing, as the analytic tries to pretend to be the synthetic. It can only do that by virtue of increasing its velocity. And so to put it very precisely in computational terms, bandwidth. So the number of cycles per second has to increase. But the point is that it's never ever actually even the least bit whole. It just is harder and harder to tell the difference, mm. uh, which is useful. Right? There are useful things that can happen. The point is it's useful but it's not real. And so we need to make that distinction. We notice that there's a difference between a useful falsehood and what is actually real. Um, We see this, for example, in in the context of the notion of the spirituality or spirit isn't real. In fact, it's the opposite. Spirit is real. And the mental fictions that we produce that are useful tools are mental fictions that we produce that are useful tools. Uh. Um. And this other kind of intelligence is real. It's grounded in reality, which is to say that it's grounded in spirit. And it involves a completely different mode of relationship. And so, as you say, when we are grounding ourselves in the form of intelligence that operates in the analytic, which is to say a mental form, um, it, it it at its best tries to go fast, which has two problems. One is that separates us further and further from the pace of the of the spiritual intelligence and confuses us. Mm-hmm. And yes, our entire society, in fact, our entire culture, to the degree to which such a thing still is what we have, um, is premised on that, that mode. And so we're very confused and we're bouncing around and we get we think that the thing we're holding in front of us is more real the further it takes us from reality. Yeah. And we think the reality is less real the more confused we get. Yes. yes. I think this other idea about building up maybe healthy realities or true realities, um, 
I was I was actually listening to a conversation by a lady named Karen. She has this show, uh, this podcast called The Meaning Code, and she was talking about to an AI engineer, and they were talking about science and what it what is real or true science actually has to be grounded in a, a very high ontology of morality if it's going to if it's going to build something that has integrity and i come from a world that uses the word integrity as this kind of you got to have integrity as a christian you got to have integrity it's like this trope but that and then this goes all the way back even to this what fascinates me about kind of the bitcoin and the trust of this this foundational level of of building something on a type of trueness and that uh, a company or a scientific endeavor has to be like, if it's going to work, it has to be grounded in a very kind of moral and true pursuit of what is true. And if, if that is, if that is at the bottom, then it, the, it, then you can build off of that, but it, it also has to. I, I've heard you've been talking lately about like a kind of coming at things from like a beauty first, and and I would see that as something like an honest curiosity, or like a you know a playful curiosity, and and that it seems to me, even in my my recent studies, as I had to go back to school and rebuild a career and all these things. Um, that what I was being asked to do when I was researching was like reinforce just a, like a modern, like a, a certain type of narrative in my research. And that the stuff that was like an eager and earnest pursuit, like the, the most recent things I think I could find was like in certain, for instance, like about blood pressure. It was like in the 80s. And then everything just kind of starts talking. Uh, they, there's no, like, it's like people quit having an honest, honest pursuit of that in research. And I don't know, that's, that's what I, I don't know, hoping things can, we can get closer to building things off of uh, a type of trueness, you know, so that they do have integrity. But so much of the conversation is like, oh, you've got to have integrity, which makes me think about, well, you've got to have the right things holding you together in your life. But that's not actually how it works. It, it has to like be built on, you know, on a firm foundation, which is, you know, a very Christian um, thing to say, but. Well, remember the word integrity is, comes from the same root as integrated. Yes. Right. So to, to have integrity is to be well integrated, meaning that a house divided against itself cannot stand. You have, you, all the parts of you have to be part of a true whole of which there is no tyranny. No part of you is tyrannizing another one into a false hole, right? grabbing and holding it together because then you're divided against yourself and it will fall apart, but it has to actually be amicably, lovingly, this is exactly the right term, the whole, the parts of you have to be lovingly well integrated into a truly um, you know, true communal whole. And the parts of you are parts of more than you. And so that, that well integrated communal whole has to be well integrated into the larger whole, which of course in this case would be the body of Christ which then of course then integrates you with the trinity so that that's a solid foundation <laughs> and if you have that then you know gold star well done <laughs> you have integrity well Good hopefully <laughs> <laughs> hopefully so i want to go back to this idea of cybernetic conversations um what what conversation are you having jordan <laughs> what what is what is drawing you to, you know, um, part of me theorizes that you've talked to people at all sorts of levels of society. You've talked, you know, I think you said whenever you were uh, kind of formulate, what was drawing you to this formulation of Civium was that you were talking to the experts of experts and they were kind of throwing up their hands about certain things about, and you're like, well, okay, I've, I've, I've talked to these people like, and, you know, now you're talking to this random guy in Arkansas on a Monday morning. Hmm. What is, what is that? Ah, okay. 
to the point. <laughs> Remember? I'm coming back okay, maybe point. that's maybe. <laughs> um, and the word cybernetic is, I'm not sure if you were using that precisely, but it turns out to be precisely the right term. Uh, the word cybernetic comes from the, the discipline of cybernetics, which is, is related to the discipline of, of system science and control theory. So it's, it's what, what are the control structures that we're using to navigate some sort of problem space? And so you know, if, I, if I have to pick up one of those little uh, toys, you know, the, the fair, to fair things that never work, I got the claw. Oh. I have to have a way of moving it in an XY domain and then causing it to go down and close. So that's my cybernetic control structure has the ability to make those kinds of choices so that I can navigate the space that I'm in. <clears throat> the reason why I'm saying that is the problem that we're faced with and i mean we meaning humanity now is strictly outside of the cybernetic capacity of the analytic mode of intelligence we have the language for that no amount of ai pick as much ai as you want doesn't matter the problem that we are faced with is strictly outside of the analytic mode of intelligence it's not a quantity issue it's a quality issue can't be done. Okay. Well, then we're going to have to figure out how to use this, participate with, and use this other mode of intelligence. This other mode of intelligence has the advantage of being infinite. So it's cybernetic capacity. The word cybernetic doesn't really even apply anymore. Um, and nothing is outside of the infinite. That's nice. Both in, in the context of nothing is outside of the infinite and nothing is beyond the infinite, That's both terms. But when we're engaging in a relearning how to operate in the that mode of which the word faith is the actual or pistis is the proper term um we begin to discover that it's not quite clear why we're doing what we're doing because that's not up to us so the short answer is i don't, from an analytic perspective i don't know <laughs> but i noticed over time that let's say for example let's just do a very simple example imagine rich and powerful people i know i know far too many billionaires like way too many billionaires and they are categorically unimpressive in almost all the ways that matter almost kind of except for the number of zeros in their bank account it's shocking they have a couple of other virtues i'll oh, give them that they're generally pretty smart um rarely really truly brilliant but generally pretty smart and generally very motivated. Right? So they have virtues that I'm being mean. But the point is, um, they lack courage in a deep way, often. And they're not that interesting, usually. But less so over time, for reasons that we can get into if you'd like. I know lots of people who are ostensibly powerful politically, you know, leaders of, of nation states or large bureaucratic organizations. Same thing. And so if you're trying to engage in a strategic analysis of who to interact with and or influence, I know brilliant people, I know knowledgeable people, I know all kinds of Nobel Prize winners, like fill in the blank. If you're trying to engage in a strategic analysis of where in the social graph to interact, what kind of social graph to construct, um, how to build something that has a certain kind of influencing power or knowledge power, you're engaging in an algorithmic construct of a design. Um, you will discover, I'll just sort of save you time, as I discovered, that there's no there there. It's not going to work. That approach is, is not available. And this is because, this is when I finally got to the point of, oh, I get it. This entire mode of intelligence is strictly incapable of solving the problem. So no, it's not a matter of not building the right kind of collective intelligence of this sort. It's a matter that the mode of even endeavoring to do so is the wrong approach. All right, well, it begins surrendering into the infinite intelligence which fortunately enough is inviting us to do so, <laughs> um, is constructed entirely out of love uh, and not a broad based sort of generic love, but a particular unique love quality seeking to reach each and e each and every one of us individually down to the core of who we are. That's really nice. It's a good, that's a, that's a really nice to have. Um, and has infinite intelligence. Well, this of course requires a different, approach now it's more like riding a surfboard than it is like driving a motorcycle 
because the ocean is in charge and you're learning how to dance with the ocean. And this is, again, my definition of what the word faith means or pistis. Um, cultivating a capacity, which is part of us. We have this capacity um, because we bear that image to perceive these very subtle perceptions and being able to make choices. So, you know, why am I talking to you? I'm talking to you because God told me to. And, and the best way that I understand what that means. You reached out in a certain way. I tried to use the form of intelligence that I've been cultivating over years that is of this sort to inquire into it. And the sense I had was, yeah, that's a good idea. Something good will come of this. It's a good, it's, it's not, there's integrity to it. There's, um, how do I say, rightness to it. And, and it's not my job to try to do anything else beyond that, other than show up here with as much of my own integrity as I can and as much clarity as I can muster in this moment. Which is, again, to say just to get out of the way and let the you know, Holy Spirit to speak through me to those who are called to listen. Right? So this is that all this starts, starts to it weaves together very nicely once the pieces start coming together. We're in this turbulent middle zone where it's very difficult to figure out. And just to put a, an example to help the more secular mind. This is how art works. And, and, or music is, a, is, is the most basic example. You know, if you're. If you're trying really hard to write music using your mind, Been there. it's going to be bad music. Um, it'll be bad either because it's just clunky or because it's, um, how do you say, manipulative. Now, you might have learned the skill of producing emotionally affective music. That's bad. Um, affective, but bad. But if you've cultivated the skill to simply listen to what the music wants to be inside of you, and it's coming from a place that you can't really identify. Where is it? I don't know. Well, what, the answer is transcendent. It's everywhere or nowhere in both. Um, but you have a faculty. You have a capacity to perceive it. And you have a capacity to not just perceive it in its most subtle sense, but ultimately because you've spent time listening to it and learning how different things inside of you in the spiritual domain are bring more clarity to that perception you then can cultivate the capacity to express it in a way that is true, meaning that the sound that you make, the, the rhythm and the tone that you put together is acknowledged by that which is expressing itself as of quality. Yes, this is, this is the thing that was coming through, the tone, the, the richness. Now, of course, then you're bound, bound by your skillfulness and your artistry. And by the limitations of being a finite being, you'll never truly fully express it. That is beyond the capacity of a finite being. And only the great, great masters will be able to express that. I mean, you can tell, like when a master expresses something, there's something about that master which is whole. Like there's a richness to it. There's a, there's a subtlety to it. There's a, um, a, a, a nuance and, and uh, rich, which is far beyond, again, the, kind of the skillful aping of the manipulator. Who, can, who make things that are you know, almost like a magician, waving hands and sparkles and fireworks. You know? It can shock you, but that's not the same thing. Right? That when the master does it, you are met, your, your perception is met in a way that is akin to, much more akin to the richness of the truly infinite intelligence that is exp expressing through that master. So that's, a, you know, anybody who's participated in that, or anybody who's done art in that way knows of what I speak. And that's why beauty first, by the way. And then... I'm just saying all of it, everything. I have a story about that. So um, in the in the late aughts, whenever I was in this kind of, I, you know, a Christian, and I was listening to all these new atheist arguments here on YouTube and uh, insecure, and I was uh, writing music, trying to write music and, and doing these church you know, worship services and um, on a search for truth. Then I betrayed my own truth or, or my belief and, you know, uh, forsook my vows. But the funny thing was, is I wanted to write an album about truth. I wanted to write an album about what is true. The prop I wanted to write a propositional album. <laughs> And I couldn't, I couldn't write anything. So, and then 
I experienced what it was like to be filled with the truth again. Mm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and there's been some new songs and, and not just, uh, actual songs, but, uh, you know, a new song of this life. So, um, it, I, that's been my experience with that in actuality. And I think, you know, when I put out the question and answers um, about, hey, I'm going to talk to Jordan tomorrow, one, um, a, an online friend here named Teo said, why are you talking to Jordan again? That was his question. Mm. And I said, you know, um, well, you know, this thing happened and we had a conversation. And then we ended up finding out that we were going to meet at some, be, be at Symbolic World. And um, you and I, we shared a meal and shared a personal moment, I felt like. And, um, and I was like, well, I want to keep having a relationship with this guy. Mm-hmm. And you're really smart. You've, got, you've thought about a lot of things really deeply. And I'd like to learn. And I think that I'm learning, or I have learned. Um, people keep asking, have you read this book? And I need to read more. Um, but I learn really well through conversation. I learn really well through um, relationship and um and listening to these ideas and i can hear the hear patterns through um senius and through uh i hear and i see it happen and then i hear a pattern through this non-competitive um thing and i see that played out in the gospel and i hear patterns about cybernetic conversations that are happening at all different levels and i see that happening and this this one guy keeps talking like these were these were pretty big ideas it seems like for this guy and, and I'm seeing them like in rea- like in life. And so I want to connect to a person who can, who's seen those patterns or, you know, has discovered those patterns, I guess. And, and um, so, yeah, that's, that's why I'm talking to you. Hmm. I think. And I like uh, the order. I don't know if you, if you're noticing the order that you put that in, I, I thought that was a very, uh, a proper order relationship was the first um i think either, either before we started recording right at the beginning we talked about some of the topics we might want to cover at the end you mentioned the notion of the anti rivalist yeah. and christ mm-hmm. where was i reading this it may have been one of those orthodox books i got at that conference but <laughs> the the notion that No, no, no. It was David Bentley Hart, I think. Okay. The, the, and, and Gregory of Nyssa. So the notion that we are pulled, no, called, we are called, all of us, the point is all of us are called into the body of Christ. Um, think about how anti rivalrous that must by necessity be. The invitation is to everybody. And we're all part of the same body. We are, in fact, not separate. So the, the concept of rivalry is, is an illusion. It's nonsense. Rivalry is, rivalry is literally just a subset of, a, a subcategory of sin, a partness, turning away from. Once you recognize the reality that you are being called into a wholeness of which you are a fully well-integrated part, a wholeness that is actually have integrity. <laughs> how funny how that turns. Remember I said, good luck with that? Well, in fact, you know, it's, it's good news. Somebody else already took care of it. You're mm-hmm. just invited to play your part. Um, then the notion of rivalry just drops away as, as incoherent. It's not just nonsense. I mean, it's not just a silly idea. It's, it's not strictly nonsense. It's incoherent. Um, because we are all part of a single body. It's, I mean, ultimately simple as that. Um, and, and that body hmm, is the relationship between the finite and the infinite. The hypostatic, the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is the entryway into that which is anti-rivalrous. I, mean, I hate to be debasing core concepts of theology by you know using some of my knucklehead ideas, but when I talk about the notion of the anti-rivalrous, if you try to think it through, you notice that if it's not pointed at the infinite, then it's not able to be what it's trying to be. Yeah. As it turns out, it is pointed at the infinite, <laughs> and so it 
it's, it's fine, right? And, and it grows in that direction. Um, and we have a, a way of doing it. Yeah, we do. And that's, um, that's the, well, that's, that's worship. Mm, yeah, nice. Which isn't it, isolated to Sunday morning. No, it's not. It, it stacks. There's a, there's a, there's places in our lives for, for that. I, I also, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a stage where I'm very critical of where I ha am or come from this space, this Christian space that I've inhabited that in some ways I'm probably not ever going to leave, but that I am uh, just, you know, critiquing, I guess, in my own life. Um, and one of them is this, uh, um, I can worship God anywhere. I don't need, I mean, I, I worship God on the deer stand. I, there's a lot of that in Arkansas, <laughs> and, which is true. And, and, and by the way, the answer is could be. Yeah. Yes. No, it's oh, true. That's true. It absolutely could be. And, and if it is, it's really good news. It is. I'm not saying it's not, but it's not in the same place on the stack. Uh huh. That's right. And, but that's, there's a, um, well, with, with these Peterson and Pejoian hierarchies of value that I've adopted into this framework, that um, we can worship anywhere, but let's also worship together and let's also create a, a time and a sacred space and let's make a, and let there be a telos that pulls our attention to that, the, to the best of our abilities. Uh, to the infinite, to the ultimate, we find in Christ. And well, um, one, one might imagine that Jesus Christ could, of, of all people, could have worshipped in the in the deer stand. Yeah, he well, noticed, in the desert. Noticed, he keeps checking out, right? He keeps going into quiet places, but to be by yeah. himself, fast and fasting, by the way, right? So, in mm. principle, you could be eating a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken in the deer stand <laughs> and worshiping. In, in practice, you should be everywhere, and. I noticed Jesus didn't play that way. So <laughs> he also went to the temple, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah. and he kept, he kept, he fulfilled the law. So I don't know. Jordan coming up on our time here. And uh, it's, it's a real joy to round this out and more personal. We went from the very abstract down to yeah. <laughs> more personal. And I appreciate you uh, going there with me and, uh, having that conversation with me and spending your time and attention with me. It's meaningful. And uh, if it makes sense again in the future, maybe it'll happen again. And thank you for that. I really, yeah. really appreciate it. Well, um, I noticed that I have a sense of, uh, I hope y'all are able to, to see that eclipse. I know that the weather may not be favorable, but I hope you guys have a good time no matter what. I've got my blinds closed right now, but yeah, I think it's going to be cool work. Um, we're excited. I'm I'm excited. Well, <laughs> my kids are going to have a good time. Yeah, it's going to be good. So, all right, man. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and hit this little video, and then we'll end just this thing backstage. All right, bro. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. Thank you.